Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Today's episode is part of our Health Policy and Advocacy Series. Nurses are the most trusted profession in the United States and have an important voice in shaping health policy work at the local, state, and national level. These episodes give oncology nurses a chance to hear from the nation's top leaders and gain understanding of how federal legislation is implemented and affects public health. Thanks for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Lisa Kennedy Sheldon, Clinical and Scientific Affairs Liaison at the Oncology Nursing Society. Today, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Ned Sharpless, the Director of the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sharpless was named to head the NCI in 2017 and also served as Acting Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration in April to November of 2019, after which he returned to the NCI. Previously, Dr. Sharpless was Professor of Medicine and Genetics Chair, Director of the University of North Carolina Lyonberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Sharpless has had an extensive lab career focused on how normal cells age and undergo malignant conversion. In addition to serving as Director of the NCI, Dr. Sharpless is Chief of the Aging Biology and Cancer Section in the National Institute on Aging's Laboratory of Genetics and Genomics where he continues his research on the biology of aging process that promotes the conversion of self-renewing cells into dysfunctional cancer cells. And with that amazing history, it is my pleasure to welcome you here with us today, Dr. Sharpless. Well, great. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me today. Well, let's start with the topic on everyone's mind, COVID-19. As we learn more about this novel coronavirus, we're starting to see the overlap between cancer treatments and COVID-19. What is the NCI doing in coordination with the NIH and other federal agencies to explore COVID-19 and find treatments and vaccines? Well, thank you, Lisa. As you can imagine, this has been an incredibly busy period in in the federal government to try and deal with this pandemic emergency. And uh, we really are working in a number of different areas on this topic. Uh, The National Cancer Institute in particular has been involved in significant work uh, around the topic of serology testing, how you test antibody for detection of antibodies in patients. And so, for example, we, we several months ago started a collaboration with the Food and Drug Administration to try and validate these tests that they are then making regulatory decisions about. So, you know, doing, doing testing for the FDA at Frederick National Lab, which is a facility the NCI runs. We have also funded a bunch of science in this area. So we've been funded by Congress to fund serology research and are dispersing those monies to extramural academic and contract uh, mechanisms to support uh, scientific advances related to the, really understanding how the immune system responds to coronavirus and and in particular its impact on cancer patients. There's a lot of expertise in the NCI. So for example, uh, we're giving advice on the vaccine trials through Doug Lowy, who is, uh, you know, the inventor of the human papillomavirus vaccine and and is an NCI, is the deputy director of the NCI and has been an important leader in the NIH to sort of plan the vaccine effort. And then there's a bunch of interesting science related to uh, virology and cancer, as you know, and particularly the topic of cytokine release syndrome, which appears to be relevant in some patients with COVID and the ability of drugs like acalabrutinib and other modulators of the immune system to try and limit the pathogenesis of that, of COVID. So, you know, a bunch of science also helping out with other federal agencies and, and trial design, very busy time in summary. Yeah, it's really extraordinary to think about how the science of cancer is actually impacting the outcomes and the treatment of COVID-19. It's, you know, we don't often think of how much the National Cancer Institute contributes to the understanding and treatment of this very vital, fast-paced, well, warp speed, right? But science that has to, has to occur at this time. We also know, so people with cancer are at a significantly higher risk for adverse events and even death from COVID-19 infections. In fact, recent findings show that people with cancer were three times more likely to die from COVID-19. And this was especially true for those with lung cancer, especially small cell lung cancers, having the highest mortality rates, almost 26%. What are we learning about the impact of cancer and those treatments for cancer on the outcomes from COVID-19 infections? Yeah, as you can imagine, this is a really rapidly evolving area of inquiry and one where the NCI is eager to get as much information to help our patients as quickly as possible. And, 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 and frankly, you know, some of the data that have come in thus far have been confusing. It is, um, we're all used to the idea that patients with cancer are more, you know, are more sensitive to viral infections. But the, the, in COVID, it, it, it appears 
not exactly how we would have expected. And so, you know, every new uh, data point seems to provide additional information. But I think the, the story you described is starting to, you know, emerge more clearly that patients with certain kinds of cancer in particular are at much higher risk for bad outcome. And we are, think we are starting to understand why. It's a combination of immuno, uh, you know, sort of a weakened immune system added to, you know, prior lung function. And for example, in patients with lung cancer and a prior history of smoking, uh, as well as advanced age, and maybe some further scientific, some other reasons why there's a, a predilection for a worsened outcome in these, these patient populations. So, you know, by aggregating data and funding uh, the variety of, you know, practitioners and cancer centers and, and groups that take care of patients with COVID and cancer, we're, we're learning more and more. And, you know, this is frankly an area where oncology nurses, had, you know, have been really front and center on this, on this effort to try and understand what's happening with these patients and understand their symptoms and their, and their progression and the complex triage issues that come up with COVID-19 in cancer patients and to help the patients feel safe. So it's really been a great partnership with the caregivers that take care of patients with cancer and COVID, and particularly oncology nurses and, and, and working at, at major academic centers in particular, to get better understanding of the pathogenesis and symptomatology of this uh, important new illness. Well, thank you. You know, of course, we are always uh, trying to support our oncology nurses with resources. And I think one symptom this year that has certainly become a, a more difficult one to understand is cough as we talk about lung cancer. COVID, you know, IO-related pneumonitis, or just a cold. So we're finding even some of our original work and resources have to be adapted for COVID-19. No doubt. These are incredible, you know, the sort of whole topic of how do you handle something like a sore throat or a cough or a mild fever in a patient with cancer, you know, that was already a challenging issue before. And now in the COVID era, it's a whole new level of complexity for the caregivers on the front lines. Yeah, indeed. You've been vocal about the decrease in cancer screening services during the first, particularly the first four months of COVID-19, and that almost 50% decrease in new diagnoses during March and April of this year during the first, you know, sort of lockdown during the pandemic. And the concerns you have, I, which are, seem really in, incredibly worrisome, frankly, for the increase in later stage diagnosis and the associated poorer outcomes and survival. In fact, you mentioned you may see an additional 10,000 cancer-related deaths due to these delays. What can oncologists, oncology nurses, and primary care providers do to promote safe screening at this time? Yeah, th thank you for the question. This has been, I think, a really important topic that we're trying to you know, get the message out because it's, it's quite nuanced. I mean, on the one hand, we want people to be safe and to try and do everything they can do to protect themselves from coronavirus infection. But on the other hand, cancer is a, is a serious problem that needs to be addressed in all aspects. That includes diagnosis, screening, prevention, and treatment. And, and we really can't afford to ignore cancer indefinitely. The problem will just get worse if, if not addressed properly. So, you know, these disruptions in care during the pandemic have been quite concerning. And you alluded to the dramatic decreases in new diagnoses, as well as dramatic decreases in screening procedures. In some data sets, more than you know, 90% reduction in things like mammography and colonoscopy. And also so-called elective procedures, and we found that word elective creates a lot of the problems because I think the general public hears elective and they think you know, minor procedure that, that is not clinically significant. But in fact, you know, elective surgeries and elective biopsies and you know, elective workups of new symptoms that may be related to a cancer, those are all getting postponed because of the pandemic. And, and, and we think that this all is going to conspire to delayed diagnosis and deferred care. And as everyone involved in cancer care knows, the, 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 the later stage one diagnosis of cancer, the typically the worse the outcome. I should mention the 10,000 number you, you came up with that, that you mentioned from our analysis, that was an analysis restricted to only two types of cancer, colon and breast. And so we think uh, we are expecting, you know, on the order of 10,000 excess deaths over a decade due to the pandemic reductions in screening and, and delayed care, uh, delayed diagnosis. When we made the, that modeling effort, we made some assumptions about how profound the disruption in care would be. And I think we actually erred on the uh, low side. The, the uh, disruptions to screening and treatment have been greater than we assumed. So we, we think that 10,000 estimate may in fact be a, a low number, that it could be worse than that as the uh, pandemic drags on and we see disruptions beyond just obviously colon and breast cancer. There's no reason to, to think that 
these same issues wouldn't affect other cancer types. By the way, we, we, we focused on those two cancer types because that's where our models were most sophisticated and developed. But as I said, we, we think the same kinds of delayed diagnosis and delayed treatment issues will come up for many other types of cancer and likely cause the same problems. So, you know, you, you asked, what can we do about this to try and really address this issue? And, you know, it's not all bad news. I think one important thing to mention is that the rapid progress in cancer, both in terms of diagnosis and treatment, has, you know, may allow us to find some people at later stage and still let them have a good outcome, for example, so that we know with better therapy, we may be able to salvage some of these patients that get diagnosed later that in older, older times would have been more difficult to treat. And I think, you know, we, we need to be clever about how we take care of patients, that we really have to figure out ways to get patients in for screening and for routine care that allows them to feel safe so the patients will come in and, and want to go to the doctor for their care. It also will protect them from you know, pandemic exposure. We have to protect the caregivers. It's important that we not have our uh, doctors and nurses get exposed to the virus by their patients. So we, we have to figure out how to provide care in innovative ways. There's a lot going on in this area, as you know, you know how to do things by telephone. You know, telehealth is a big new way to deliver care. And, uh, but also uh, ways of having the patients sort of move through the facility in, 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 in ways to minimize their exposure and, and, and to make them feel safe and keep the caregivers safe. So I, I think through collective action, we can both take advantage of you know, new therapies and new treatments. We can be more clever about how we provide care. And we can really commit to our patients that we're going to try and do right by them under difficult circumstances. I would like to mention one other thing here, which is, and it wasn't intentional, but, you know, just for a variety of reasons for modeling, we, we focused on mortality initially, you know, the idea of excess deaths. But really, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of morbidity, non-lethal cancer, but still symptoms and problems created by the cancer that will be very significant to our patients because of delayed care and delayed screening. And this is really a topic, again, where I think nurses and primary care providers are really on the front line here because... I worry a lot about symptom management, for example, during the pandemic. Are, are our patients who, are, who have cancer, is their pain going to be controlled adequately? Is their nausea going to be controlled adequately? If they're scared to come to the hospital, if they're scared to come to the clinic, if they're, scared, if they're unable to reach their caregiver. And so I, I think that this is another area where we, as I said, mortality has gotten a lot of the press and the attention initially, but morbidity could be as big or a bigger deal. And again, we need to be creative and innovative and take collective action for our patients so that we can make sure that we can prevent excess death, but also needless suffering. Uh, those are great points. And certainly things that are, you know, resonate with oncology nurses as we're trying to use the telephone as we have for decades to triage our patients. And now we see, of course, the, the takeoff in the technology for telehealth, telemedicine as being a way to be able to reach our patients where they are. So it's having a lot of impact, as you mentioned, you know, the technology and connecting patients and providers. How will this digital transformation change patient provider care, not just now, but going forward? Yeah, I, I think it's a really uh, interesting topic. And certainly where the NCI is very eager to fund some research. So we put out a so-called RFI, a request for information from caregivers to ask them, what are the really key research questions that the NCI needs to address related to telehealth and other, other new technologies to provide care, particularly care in a distance setting? And I imagine that we will be finding important research uh, topics to address because, you know, there are still a lot of unknowns, you know, what you can do safely over the phone versus what requires an in-person visit. I do say, though, you know, I, I think, you know, hearing from cancer center directors and hospital executives and other kinds of, you know, caregiver organizations, it's really clear that patients like many aspects of this. They like being able to get a lot of their care via telehealth. They like being able to see doctors at facilities without having to sit in traffic for a long time. In some instances, they like the ability to see doctors in, in, in different states or across state lines. So I, I think that, you know, the telehealth changes have been dramatic and swift and very popular with patients. And I would think, in, 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 for the most part, you know, good in terms of care, but certainly an area where we need to see uh, some more research on uh, the implementation science behind these projects. And also, we're going to, you know, I think the regulatory environment is going to be very interesting here, as you, I'm sure, are aware, uh, CMS has stated, uh, and the president has issued an executive order, that we want to preserve many of these good features of telehealth, that we want to make them permanent for our patients. But, you know, exactly how that's going to mean and what that's going to mean and how payers are going to support this, private payers in particular, and how, you know, state licensure agencies are going to, you know, allow this new normal to occur. 
we don't know yet. So I, I think the NCI will have a really important role to provide the key data that we need to understand, you know, what we can do safely uh, for our patients via telehealth and how we can make the good aspects of this permanent and a permanent benefit to our patients. Yeah, I I think uh, we're all seeing the benefit of being able to reach our patients more remotely and that that research that actually the implementation components and the actual technology, those interventions are going to need more study. So it's great to hear the NCI is interested in that as well. You know, it's really clear that decades of research are, are paying off and you continue to be an advocate for sustained and enhanced clinical trials now during COVID-19 so we can continue advancing cancer discovery. So there have been a remarkable advances in decreasing cancer mortality. And just recently, you noted that the non-small cell cancer mortality has fallen significantly, probably due to these new advances in immunotherapy and targeted therapies. What other advances in cancer treatment do you see coming down the pipeline at the NCI? Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, a number of things to say on that topic. First off, you know, from both my uh, work at the FDA and the NCI, it's been really uh, striking to see how, how brisk the pace of cancer science and the translation into, you know, beneficial therapies and, and other approaches for patients, how rapidly that's been going. And, you know, when, when I was at FDA, we, you know, in these sort of eight months that I was there, we approved something like 20 new drugs, uh, you know, either primary approvals or label expansions in cancer indications. So there's just this phenomenally productive rate of discovery for patients. And, and, and some of these agents are quite beneficial, you know, first in class medicines and, and very new approaches with very high uh, response rates and even, even agents that have curative potential in some instances. So we really are seeing great pace of research and really paying off for patients. And, and you mentioned the data published last week in the New England Journal by a group of NCI investigators that dug deep into this topic about why cancer mortality has been declining, particularly rapidly over the last few years. And a lot of that is driven by, you know, cancers like lung cancer, where the incidence is going down and it's been going down. You know, the number of new cases has been declining for a while, presumably because of tobacco control, you know, less people smoking in the United States. And that's, you know, been a great public health story uh, over the last few decades, although still a lot more to be done there. There's still too many people smoking in the United States and we need to, you know, do everything we can to particularly prevent for young people from taking up cigarettes and e-cigarettes. But, you know, against that backdrop of declining incidence, we've now seen a, a, an even faster rate of decrease in mortality for lung cancer. And after an elaborate, complex analysis of national statistics, the NCI has come to the conclusion that, that some of that is being driven by better treatment in diseases like lung cancer and, and also in, in melanoma, where there's a similar pattern. And so, you know, when I was a starting as an oncologist, you know, melanoma and advanced non-small cell lung cancer were about the two worst cancers you can imagine having. I mean, we have no effective therapies back then. They were really, frankly, a death sentence for patients to have, a, you know, metastatic disease with those cancers. And now in both non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma, we're seeing quite improved outcomes, in some cases, cures using targeted therapy and immunotherapy for those patients. And so, you know, that progress is great to see. So, you know, there's exciting progress being seen in a variety of diseases. There's a number of uh, new approaches that are being developed. And, you know, it's, it's been a, a great time to be a cancer researcher. But then there's the bit of bad news, which is you, you alluded to, which is the topic of clinical trials during the pandemic. So clinical trials really are the engine whereby we make progress for cancer patients. You know, all new therapies and, and, and other sorts of approaches for cancer uh, screening and, and prevention need clinical validation through classic clinical trial testing. And, uh, you know, enrollment in clinical trials has declined significantly during the pandemic. Uh, you know, we saw probably a 50% reduction in clinical trials enrollment in NCI trials earlier in the pandemic. It has ticked up a little bit since then, but it is still significantly lower than we would see in normal times. And this is very, uh, you know, causes some anxiety at the NCI because we know that if trials accrue at half the rate, they take twice as long. And that's really going to sort of decrease this great productivity we've seen in cancer research significantly, maybe even, you know, cut it in half for a little while. And, and we really don't want that to happen. We want to make sure this progress is preserved to the extent possible. And, and, you know, we're working with scientists and regulators in every way possible to make sure that we don't lose uh, ground. You know, we don't sort of take our foot off the accelerator and, and see a decrease in the rate of this great progress in terms of cancer research. Absolutely. And, you know, and this kind of leads me into that topic of access to clinical trials, because we do have these significant issues reaching 
patients, not just because of the pandemic, but often those who are in underserved or underrepresented areas where they don't have cancer centers or rural settings. We're very fortunate to see that during the public health emergency, we have some innovations that are helping the clinical trials reach the patients, you know, with the delivery of drugs directly to the home and e-signatures. What can clinical trials nurses, particularly those in oncology clinical trials, look for to be able to enroll and retain their patients on clinical trials, even though they're not in an academic medical center? Yeah, this is an area that needs a lot of conversation. I think the, you know, you alluded to the changes that we made on NCI trials that I think have been very important. So, you know, really at the very early, when it was clear the pandemic was going to disrupt, you know, hospital uh, and, and clinic function, we started working with the FDA to try and figure out how we could do clinical trials, particularly therapeutic clinical trials during a, a pandemic. And we came up with a number of solutions some of which I think have been quite successful. So for example, the ability to mail you know, investigational new drugs to patients rather than having them come into clinic. That normally wasn't allowed on a clinical trial, but we've changed that, allowing for consenting over the phone and for uh, you know, signing consent over the phone by, by telehealth approaches has been a big deal, allowing people to change what site they get care. So in old days, we would require a visit to the you know, tertiary care cancer center. And now, you know, for even if it was for a follow-up CAT scan or something, and now we're allowing patients to get some of that care closer to home without it being considered a protocol deviation. So we put in a bunch of changes to try and make clinical trials easier to do during the pandemic. And, and for the most part, we've now polled our clinical trialists and they're very popular. So that those changes I mentioned and several others are things that the investigators really like and the patients really like. And it may, you know, maybe if there is a silver, silver lining to this pandemic, we are, we are learning some stuff about how we can open trials more nimbly and collect patients, uh, you know, and and accrue patients at remote sites and then, you know, do things through telehealth that will allow us to, uh, you know, really, uh, as you mentioned, kind of distribute clinical trials into more diverse communities and and different settings. And the the NCI has been very committed to the topic of accruing underrepresented minority patients and vulnerable populations to our clinical trials for a long time. And it's an area where we had been having some success through the NCOR network, the National Community Oncology Research Program, NCOR. And that network has a number of sites that uh, do a good job of accruing patients from more diverse communities and and had been making some progress in that regard, but it's still not good enough. It's an area where we'd like to make further improvement to uh, have really representative populations on our clinical trials. And we're hoping some of these new capabilities that we mentioned will allow this to occur. And so it's really important that, uh, you know, oncology nurses who work in a community setting are aware of these new efforts by the NCI that we're really trying to bend over backwards to figure out how we can get their patients on our trials. Probably the, the most important initiative there over the last few years of the NCI really is the NCOR program, which now can you know, open trials at 1,100, you know, 1,100 sites in the United States, even some fairly complicated trials. So for example, the NCI MATCH trial which uh, sequenced patients' somatic tumors, and then based on the mutations found in their tumors, they were assigned to, you know, one of up to some 30-some different arms, you know, a multi-arm trial. That's a relatively complicated trial, NCI match was, and yet we did it at 1,100 sites through the NCOR network. So really allowing patients to, you know, get on trial without having to sit in traffic and drive seven hours to a cancer center or something. So so that, that is an area where we continue to focus a lot of our efforts but it requires a different kind of regulatory structure. It requires a, a different way of administering trials, and it requires kind of a different way of collecting data. And these are all areas where we've been making you know real effort to make this easier on the patients. And as I mentioned, the pandemic may, in, in some strange way, help that effort because now we're having to do a lot more local care and a lot less you know travel and a lot more telehealth. And so you know that that may be, as I said. One of the good things to come out of the pandemic is a sort of more nimble framework for clinical trials accrual in the community. Yeah, you know, and, and integrating in the community oncologists and the non-oncology specialists and even the PCPs in the trials can only advance accrual and retention of patients in the community. So that's, I think that's a wonderful. And, and I, I know you have a virtual conference coming up with NCOR and the NCI in two parts later on this year. So it, I'm sure you'll have a lot to talk about. I want to move over into the targeted therapies and this era of genomics that we live in now and how this is shifting not only the delivery of cancer care, but the type of cancer care and testing required to make decisions about the appropriate care. 
How does this build on precision oncology and the next phases of research at the NCI? I think one of the major paradigm shifts of my, you know, that has occurred in cancer during my career as an oncologist has really been related to this notion that, you know, cancer isn't one disease or 10 diseases, but it's hundreds or, or thousands of diseases. So, you know, we no longer have, you know, breast cancer. Now we have ER positive, you know, BRCA1 mutants uh, breast cancer, or, you know, we, we, we have these molecular subtypes. And, and I think we mentioned the data earlier in non-small cell lung cancer, where we have really now identified many, many different subtypes of that, that cancer that differ in sort of their pathogenesis and their epidemiology, and importantly, their response to therapy. And so these targeted agents that are matched to the patient in a, in a very precision oncology manner has really been, I think, an important advance for patients because it allows the use of more effective drugs that have less toxicity in the right patient at the right time. So we spoke about the NCI MATCH trial. That was uh, you know, an effort of the NCI to really develop this approach. And that trial in adult patients is, is winding down. It's enrolled over, you know, closing in on 7,000 patients or something and using multiple different drugs. And, and we, we, you know, see what you see when you do that is that some of these agents are useful in molecularly targeted patients and some are not. And it, it, it's, you know, it says that this is going to be a complex task, that we're going to have to work through these various uh, somatic mutations that occur in different kinds of cancer in a very disciplined and, and complete manner. And it, it may take a while to get through all of these events, particularly some of the rare ones. And then, of course, new therapies to target these specific molecular events are being developed all the time. But I think, you know, the, the match paradigm of, you know, molecular characterization of the patient followed by, you know, tailored therapy is, is really working for patients now, as I mentioned. And it's been broadly adopted by the pharmaceutical industry which, you know, you, you can remember back to a period when the pharmaceutical industry wanted to treat all cancer patients the same because they thought that was the biggest market size. But now they've gone uh, fully into this, you know, precision oncology approach where they develop drugs for very small populations of patients with specific lesions, molecular lesions, if the, you know, if the response rates and outcomes can be good enough. And we've also now seen this, you know, the match framework, you know, these, these basket and umbrella trials being adopted by a number of other organizations beyond the NCI match that run different kinds of cancer clinical trials. And I think that's a really healthy and good development. And I think that, you know, this, as I mentioned, is, is good news for our patients. And, and then it allows you to use, you know, things like precision radiation oncology or targeted kinase inhibitors or immunotherapy in, in the right way for patients that have the most chance of benefiting from that specific therapy. It does create a, a complicated data problem for us because if you have these thousands of different kinds of, of cancer and these many different therapies to apply to them, doing classical clinical trials with, you know, 800 patients per arm and like we used to do in the old days, that becomes very difficult. And so now we have to really learn from every patient. We have to learn what works in specific individuals and, and, and try and then, you know, design clinical trials that are uh, often in smaller populations so that we can get the information we need to figure out, you know, what's going to work best in the future. So it, it does provide some challenges from the point of view of clinical trials and data collection. But, you know, this is obviously an area where the NCI is focused to tremendous resources and effort lately to try and, you know, build the infrastructure whereby we learn from every patient through, uh, you know, the collection of data. I'm really glad you brought up the data point. Thank you. That's a great overview. Yeah, I was thinking, having also been in cancer care for many years, it used to be simpler because you knew from a particular anatomic site what the tumor was and what the treatment was going to be. And as we move more and more to these tumor agnostic indications, as we think more and more about the individual markers on a particular type of cancer, each cancer becomes its own unique disease. And so we have to be uh, very careful about how we collect that data. And from, a, I, from a randomized control trial, that's really difficult because you're not going to get those huge sample sizes anymore. But it also brings us back down to the individual patient and how do we make sure that we collect the information for that patient and be able to aggregate data. So one of the great challenges is how do we pull the data from all the different sources of information now? so that we can move forward with healthcare realignment and sort of the data aggregation. And I know you've been very, you've spoken very eloquently about this in the past because that requires us to align our data better. How can we do that, work with the NCI and be able to think about those initiatives where we're pulling information from research, from the clinical site, or from a telemedicine visit? How are we going to pull that all together so that we can move cancer care forward? 
the answer here is that we're going to figure this out because we have to figure this out. There really isn't another way to do this. You know, as the diseases become more, we appreciate their heterogeneity and the, they need different treatments and different you know, methods of care. You know, there's just too many different kinds of cancer getting too many different kinds of therapy to rely on, you know, very large clinical trials for all new uh, treatment advances. And so, so we're going to have to figure this out is, uh, you know, how do we really make the data work for every patient so that we can be uh, maximally efficient? It is a complicated problem. So, uh, you know, we had hoped and still have some hopes that, you know, some of this could be done retrospectively by clever approaches to mine medical records, uh, to find data that, uh, you, you know, from real world uh, use. So, so, for example, just go out and look at the, the, the medical records of patients that have already been treated. That turns out to be very hard for a number of reasons. And, and the data, what one can learn from those sort of real world analyses are often thought provoking, they're hypothesis generating. But, you know, in terms of, you know, the data that would be of sufficient quality for a regulatory decision, like to approve a new drug or to change the standard of care, often the, the data are not of sufficient quality for those kinds of major decisions. And so, so we're trying to think both retrospectively and prospectively. You know, the retrospective part is, are there ways we can get data from old, already treated patients and uh, existing clinical experiences uh, using uh, fancy artificial intelligence or other kinds of data mining technologies, or just you know brute force, uh, having lots and lots of data miners sort of go through and properly incentivized. But then the other thing we're thinking about is the, is the prospective problem is, is there a way we could change things now that would allow us to collect data on our patients in real time that would make those data then easier to combine and aggregate and, and I, I think, frankly, you know, given our experience the last few years, that's probably the uh, approach that is going to be ultimately more successful. You know, you can learn things from the retrospective mining of data, but we think the prospective collection of data, doing it slightly differently, is probably going to be the uh, longer, greater solution. And so some of this is, you know, doing clinical trials a little differently. And, and patients on clinical trials, we, we collect data already that's in pretty good format. But, you know, how can we make those data aggregable and shareable and and, and put them in places where they can be investigated. But we're, we're also trying to figure out things that we can do that would allow patients to uh, get treated with very minimal changes to their treatment because one really can't burden a busy care provider with an additional, oh, by the way, when you're seeing your patient, you also have to fill out this form or something, right? You know, if, if there are a bunch of more checkboxes to do in the electronic medical record or whatnot, that, that is unpopular with a caregiver. And so we're trying to subtly change how data are entered into the medical record such that it's not a lot of work for the uh, the caregiver, but then those data become you know what's called machine readable, where where you you can pull out some of those data later on and learn from those patients, even though they were treated in sort of a real world setting. We're going to figure this out. It it, it turns out to be a, a tough problem, but but as I said, we, we we have to find a solution because that's really how we're going to make the most progress for our patients. Probably the ar area where I'm uh, most excited about our projects in this in this regard right now are really in the area of pediatric cancer. Because, in, you know, pediatric cancer, it's about 11,000 cases a year in the United States, 12,000 cases a year in the United States. Every pediatric cancer is, is a relatively rare cancer, and doing clinical trials in those populations is very hard. Uh, you know, but we, we still have too many kids uh, with bad outcomes from cancer in the United States, and we, we really want to make progress in pediatric oncology. But this is an area where we're really going to have to figure out how to learn from every patient and have every, every patient's experience be maximally informative. And uh, so this is where we have a new $500 million initiative, a 10-year program for the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative uh, that was you know, first proposed by the president at the State of the Union Address. And now this is an area that is well underway to really figure out how to get the most best usable data from every patient so that we can drive the changes to care and uh, as quickly as possible, but also in a way that's beneficial to the patient, that protects their privacy, that is safe and optimal from the uh, patient care experience point of view. So it's, it's a tough problem, but I think an area where we're investing a lot of time and effort and we, we will make progress. What, what we learn in children, I think we can then apply to adults and we, we will also, that, that experience will help us with prospective data collection in adult oncology patients too. That's a, a great note to leave on. I, uh, the positive aspects of being able to collect data and, and especially among our, our most vulnerable, among our children, it could actually inform how we collect data prospectively going forward for all people who have a cancer diagnosis. Dr. Sharpless, I want to thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation and so informative. And uh, thank you for being here with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's delightful to speak. And uh, thank you for what you do on behalf of patients. 
Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. 